Today's session is about Japan. What are the transformation imperatives for Japan? What are the strengths and values that Japan can draw on? What are some areas that require reforms? And what lessons might Japan hold for the rest of the world? We have a diverse slate of distinguished speakers and commentators with us today. And rather than introduce everyone together, I will introduce each one of them one by one just before my opening question to them. First, a bit of background to this session. The word unprecedented has been used with unprecedented frequency when it comes to describing the COVID-19 crisis. Its consequences are far-reaching, wide-ranging across the planet, more so than anything else in living memory. To address this, we must learn from each other's experiences. And to that end, the World Economic Forum, through a regional action group, has been bringing global leaders together to shape a world that's more sustainable, more inclusive, and more resilient based on stakeholder principles. Stakeholder principles are not new to Japan. The Japanese tradition of Sampo Yoshi, which translates to three-way satisfaction between the seller, buyer, and society at large, dates back 500 years. So drawing on that history and philosophy, Japan today has the opportunity to become a leader in stakeholder capitalism, while at the same time, tackle some urgent reforms. So today's title question is this, what approaches, what practices, and what partnerships should Japan pursue to shape a positive post-COVID era? So let me go straight to our distinguished panel. First, Mr. Kengo Sakurada. Mr. Kengo Sakurada is the group CEO of Sampa Holdings. He's also chairman of the Association of Corporate Executives in Japan, one of the most influential business associations in Japan, giving him a panoramic, multi-sector view of industry. Mr. Sakurada, as chairman of the Japan Association of Corporate Executives, what do you think are the fundamental changes brought on by the COVID crisis? Thank you. Thank you for having me this, uh, uh, for this uh, exciting session. And uh, first of all, I have to uh, thank you for the describing the Japanese situation as, uh, as uh, accurately as possible. So there's nothing I could add, actually. But for the sake of myself, I would like to say something. Uh, as you know, the many countries have already promoted globalization and digitalization and the current uh, capitalism. And they have enjoyed technological innovations that generates profit. While this has resulted, resulted in dramatic economic and societal development, it has also created inequality, environmental destruction, and other distortions that leads to a level that we cannot ignore anymore. Um, the pandemic as you know, highlighted this negative aspect and uh, pose an important question or doubt about the sustainability of human society. The world is now capitalism. That well, uh, sorry, uh, the world is now standing at the historic uh, turning point in search for recalibration of capitalism or new capitalism. As for Japan. After reaching one of the world's top economic powers, it has been staying in comfortable zone and going down the hill very slowly for the last 30 years. Because of that comfortableness and the slowness, slowness there's been little sense of urgency like the boiling frogs, and that has recreated a lot. Japan has not challenged seriously enough many of its macro problems, such as aging society, declining population, and low economic growth, and therefore worsening fiscal deficit. Although, luckily enough, the deficit itself has been financed domestically so far. We have not taken enough risks to address insufficient diversity and low productivity. 
Now, COVID crisis has brought to the light these issues simultaneously. We should utilize this momentum to reconsider society itself and the behaviors of individuals or the companies. We must accept that this could be the last, last chance to make changes. And we should not return to the former state like shape memory ally, which is an ally that returned to its remembered shape when heated. <laughs> In our future society, the new normal is characterized by discontinuity or constant discontinuous changes. Conflict, division over national interests might deepen in international community. The cost post COVID future, cost uh, post COVID future, calls for our college to act with commitment and ambition to break away from the past and envision the future we wish to create. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sakurada. Um, let me now move to our next speaker, Robin Niblett. Uh, Dr. Robin Niblett is director and chief executive of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, or Chatham House, as it's famously known the world over. Before joining Chatham House in 2007, Robin was the executive vice president and chief operating officer of Washington Bay's Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. He currently co-chairs the World Economic Forum's Global Futures Council on Geopolitics. Robin, from your vantage point, what are the major geopolitical challenges of our time? And what role can Japan play in promoting multilateralism? Well, thank you, uh, Luffy. Thank you for the introduction, and I uh, appreciate this opportunity to join the Regional Action Group on Japan um, uh, to discuss these topics. And uh, let me use my time as efficiently as possible. I think there's a very simple answer to your first question. Um, the major geopolitical challenge facing the world right now is the great, greater and growing strategic competition between the United States, its allies, and China. Um, this uh, competition, which has been rising for a while, has been intensified, as you all know, by the COVID pandemic and the fact that uh, China is emerging probably stronger from this crisis than it went in, certainly in relative uh, terms. Um, it has exposed uh, the vulnerabilities and the weaknesses of many of the developed economies, certainly in terms of their supply chains, their access to vaccines, to uh, protective uh, uh, equipment, to deal with the pandemic. Uh, it's exposed European as well dependencies on the Chinese market. And in return, it is a reminder of China of its vulnerability uh, and its exposure to Western markets, especially after the Trump administration. Um, what we've seen, I think, uh, driving this process as well is some greater Chinese assertiveness in its foreign policy. You all know the list in Hong Kong, Taiwan, Senkaku Islands, which are particularly relevant, obviously, to our Japanese colleagues here. Uh, the South China Sea, Australia, etc., India. Um, I think most importantly, though, Lufthi, on this is that it is also, uh, I think, morphing into an ideological competition. I heard Xi Jinping, President Xi's comments uh, earlier in the Stavos agenda, saying it is not ideological. This is more about, uh, uh, you know, great power accommodation. But I fear that it is going in that direction, and this is why. Speaking from Europe, um, there is a sense that Europeans as well are starting to align more closely with the US. I know there was a lot of um, criticism in the United States of the EU signing its comprehensive agreement uh, on investment. Um, but I do feel, in my opinion, that this was a high water mark, uh, a, a, you know, a, a top end really of EU China cooperation for the moment with new investment restrictions, uh, maybe a border adjustment mechanism emerging um, to deal with uh, climate change, um, and with the UK having abandoned, I think, its golden era with China, we are heading to a more uh, competitive environment. Um, and I think we're going to see at the beginning of this Biden administration a coming together of the United States, Europe, and other allies around the world, I think including Japan, um, on trying to think how do we together protect democracies protect democracies at a time of rising uh, Chinese influence and power 
which is not obviously based on the same democratic uh, values. So we really face a fundamental dilemma. How do we address shared challenges with China, which are many, 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 climate change, the global health pandemic, development in Africa, et cetera, while at the same time taking this slightly tougher position? Um, and I think there is a, uh, an answer here, and this will bring me to my second part of what I want to say, which is what Japan does. I think that the having greater capacity to compete actually might make it easier in the long run for the US, Japan, uh, European countries to cooperate with China. It's partly because of our sense of weakness um, that we are finding it difficult. Um, I read with great interest the uh, paper prepared uh, by the Regional Action Group on Japan uh, are ahead of this. And I suppose that of its four great resets, the fourth is resetting the global collaboration framework, and in particular, Japan's role in this process. Um, what I would say is that uh, uh, I noted in there this idea of Japan being uh, a great mediator for transnational cooperation amongst the private sector to try to avoid a decoupling emerging between uh, the Chinese market and uh, let's say, Japanese, US, European. And I think what I would say is, I, I agree, avoiding decoupling is important, but I think that is not uh, sufficient. The pressure for some decoupling is intensifying right now. If you read the latest paper by, um, private paper written by Eric Schmidt and Jared Cohen, formerly uh, Eric Schmidt with Google, uh, pushing and talking about the needs for some decoupling in the US. The question is, can Japan cooperate from a position of strength? Um, can we, uh, uh, can Japan help as part of its collaboration reset and it's helping uh, multilateral cooperation? Can it help make a stronger alliance to then collaborate from strength with uh, China? And I think there are five ideas. I'll lay them out very quickly uh, in just one minute. Um, first of all, I think uh, Japan needs to lean forward into its role in the G7. Um, uh, as you know, on the British presidency this year, there was an intention to start to explore enlarging the G7. I think a Japanese voice into which countries uh, should be brought into this broader process of a community of democracies will be very important. I would argue don't be too limited by just 10. Um, I think uh, having a, a broader set of voices from around the world would be important. To what purpose are we enlarging the G7? And I think more secure supply chains, greater technological capacity, AI, et cetera, um, which Japan has such great contributions to make, will be very important. If uh, uh, the West feels stronger technologically, it will be in a stronger position not to decouple from China. Second point, um, use Japan's leadership on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the now the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, to enlarge uh, the community of democratically-minded countries that are setting standards for data sharing, open trading, investment rules, data storage. Could Japan open up doorways and conversations with the EU and the UK? I think it'll be very difficult in the time being with the US, but this would really help uh, Japan do what was proposed in the paper, move from being a, a rule follower to a rule shaper, use its position in TPP. I'm not sure that the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership and TPP will be able to be linked together so easily in the near term. Um, I think the three other things, which I don't need to say much about, but I'll put, list them, um, uh, support open internet in the UN. Uh, very important to have Japan's voice alongside uh, Europe and America on that. Obviously supporting WTO reform, especially, which is noted in your paper, especially on the issue of subsidies for uh, uh, countries with large state roles in their economies like China. And finally, finally and importantly, COP26. Uh, it's implicit in the whole paper on the other three resets, uh, uh, climate changing, addressing it, this is essential. Very promising sign by Prime Minister Suga in October, committing Japan to the 2050 net zero target. Can Japan and can Japan uh, Japanese companies push for some clear uh, nationally determined contributions so that they can give real meaning to this idea uh, at the 2050 uh, uh, commitment uh, in the Glasgow summit that will take place in November, the COP26 summit. Having a strong Japanese voice on this with maybe some legally committing uh, commitments uh, to uh, this target, I think will be incredibly important, as well as all the great technological work 
that Japan is doing on batteries and circular economy, etc. So I'll stop there. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. We heard, we heard, first of all, a voice from inside Japan asking for a greater sense of urgency to recalibrate domestically, and now a voice from outside asking Japan to lean forward and have a louder voice in international affairs. Uh, let me go back inside again to uh, invite Professor Heizo Takenaka. Professor Takenaka is a former minister in the cabinet of Prime Minister Koizumi, having held at various times the portfolios of economic fiscal policy, financial services, privatization, internal affairs and communications. His pre-ministerial academic career saw him uh, at Harvard and the University of Pennsylvania. And since leaving government, his return to academia now as professor at Keio University. Professor Takenaka, good to see you again. And uh, my question for you, sir, when we talk about transforming an economy from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism, what does success look like at the macroeconomic level? And what are the priority steps that Japan should take to effect that transformation? Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairman, for this opportunity. Well, uh, how to reform Japan, Japanese economy uh, under su uh, such a serious situation of COVID-19, and how to strengthen our uh, stakeholder capitalism? This is a very important topic, I understand. Well, regarding the Japanese economy, I'd like to mention the short-term problem and mid-term problem. In the short run, well, our Japanese economy is also very seriously negatively affected by this COVID-19 crisis. In the second quarter of last year, the GDP growth rate uh, was uh, 20, minus 29 percent, minus 29 percent, very serious uh, negative growth we experienced. However, on the other hand, uh, the rate of unemployment increased only by 0.5 percent, from 2.5 to 3.0 percent. And uh, also the number of uh, bankruptcy rather decreased under such circumstances. This is partly reflecting the strength, uh, our merit of so-called stakeholders' capitalism. At the same time, of course, stakeholder capitalism had its strengths, but also its weakness. Well, this is indicating at the same time uh, the transformation of the industry, of the structural reform of the industry. The speed is very slow, as I mentioned by Sakurada san But anyway, in the short run, economy is relatively stable because of very unique Japanese system, also partly owing to very strong support from the government. Well, uh, take, based upon that, we have to consider at the same time the, uh, the, the medium, medium term problem. Well, uh, now, well, in the corporate sector, a corporate debt, business debt is increasing dramatically. Uh, because where well, the government and the banking sector is supporting uh, these companies, providing huge liquidity. And so because of that, the businesses are surviving. But uh, well, sooner or later, this will become a very serious problem, corporate sector debt. And very interestingly, at this moment, rating agency, a living rating or a scoring unchanged, so uh, this is, uh, uh, consequently, this is indicating even in the banking sector, the non-performing loan is not increasing. But from here on, we will face this kind of problem, the excess debt of the corporate sector and non-performing loan in the banking sector. This is exactly what we experienced uh, after the burst of the bubble in the 90s. Uh, I was in charge of the disposing of non-performing non loan at that time, this must be a relatively tough job. Well, this is a, 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 you know, uh, this kind of problem is uh, existing. Well, uh, Professor uh, Sidig san asked me the, uh, what will be the main factor uh, to uh, strengthen our economy. Uh, one is, uh, well, there could be two factors existing. One is, uh, for example, well, in the case of Japan, business startup ratio is quite low, about half of that of the United States. At the same time, business closing ratio is low, at far, uh, about half of that, that of the United States. Well, this is indicating so-called metabolism of the industry, metabolism of the uh, you know, uh, businesses, companies are quite low. In order to strengthen this metabolism, increase this metabolism, well, two factors are needed. 
One is to strengthen the corporate governance, the corporate governance. Oh, this is actually happening. And the corporate, uh, what to say, uh, governance code is going to be strengthened again. And uh, well, this is uh, uh, where uh, started. This started at uh, the time of Abe government and a new Prime Minister Suga is uh, uh, you know, going to succeed this kind of idea. Another one is the labor market reform. Well, labor market, basically, well, traditionally, Japanese labor system is supported by the long-term uh, lifetime employment and seniority-based pay system. Of course, now the reality is changing. The labor market is becoming much more flexible. However, still, we need more effort to change this, this uh, type of uh, very traditional style of uh, working. Uh, but so this is uh, uh, exactly we, uh, that's, uh, need, uh, what's needed as a structural reform of the Japanese society. And new Prime Minister Suga is, going, is very eager to realize that. In, in my understanding. Uh, but anyway, uh, at the same time, we have a great chance because our prime minister is going to establish the digital agency uh, to uh, reform digital transformation of Japan. And the prime minister Suga very clearly declared the carbon neutral by 2050. And uh, in the third supplementary budget last year, uh, the government uh, realized the green, so-called green fund to support the uh, carbon uh, neutral. But from here on, we have to discuss very seriously carbon pricing policy. Carbon pricing is not, not, not employed here in Japan, but uh, sooner or later, we have to discuss this uh, very difficult problem of carbon, uh, carbon pricing issue. Uh, still, we have a lot of problems, the aging uh, issue. This will be discussed later on, uh, maybe Professor Gratton and so so, and also uh, fiscal consolidation is needed or not, this kind of macroeconomic problem is still existing. But anyway, uh, the, the, as I mentioned, for the further development of the Japanese economy, the strengthening the corporate governance and also uh, much more dynamic labor market reform is needed. Uh, so based upon that, we will be able to strengthen our so-called uh, so uh, stakeholder capitalism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Takenaka. It sounds um, almost as if the third arrow, as we used to call it before, the third arrow of economics, you need that in a supercharged manner right now. But also there are new engines of growth, the digital transformation and the green uh, sector. Thank you for your comments, Professor Takenaka. Uh, allow me to now move on to Professor Linda Gratton. Professor Gratton is Professor of Management Practice at London Business School where she directs the program called Human Resource Strategy in Transforming Companies. She has written extensively about new ways of working, the rise of complex collaboration, and the impact of, impact of longevity on society. Her book, The Shift, received the Best Book of the Year Award in Japan in 2012. Professor Linda Gratton is now the moment of opportunity to radically change workplace practices and the way employees operate in companies, and specifically for Japan, what transformations are required within Japanese companies so that they can be more productive, more diverse, and more inclusive? Well, thank you so much for this opportunity to join this extraordinary group of people talking about something that's very, very crucial. And, and, and might I also, as co-chair of the Council on Jobs, I'm so pleased to be part of this group and bring to you some of the ideas that we have of jobs. But of course, today we're speaking specifically about Japan. Uh, just a, just a, a moment, really, of reflecting on Japanese practices, which I now know into our second year of COVID probably seems like a long way away. But let me just reflect on certainly what I saw uh, in the many years that I've been studying and, and coming to Japanese corporations. Um, first of all, a, a very clear view that for people to work together, particularly knowledge workers, they needed to be present with each other. So uh, an idea that face-to-face -face was absolutely crucial and that actually drove a whole set of other complex issues around the use of the office, that people needed to come to the office, the fact that they had to be together, often in a headquarters in Tokyo, which meant that many Japanese workers were commuting two hours each way to their office. 
uh, and uh, and also an idea that decision making uh, could be made also in that way. And we knew f from the beginning uh, that this was problematic. Uh, that whilst at the set, whilst on the one hand, Japanese practices had uh, built much of the, the long hours of culture, the presenteeism had built the basis of Japanese industrial society, it was now beginning to work against uh, the uh, organization. Uh, and as uh, we heard earlier, this has resulted in, a, in part of the, the, the result of the slowdown in the economy, but also the inflexibility that seems to be problematic. And I want to just point to a couple of issues that it was beginning to create. Uh, one was location. I, I sat on Prime Minister Abe's council looking at how Japan could prepare itself for uh, the future in terms of its aging population. One thing that came out very early is that this focus on Tokyo, and by the way, we have the same issue in the UK, meant that many regions outside of Tokyo were really not building that sort of entrepreneurial spirit, were not attracting young people, were becoming really places where just old people lived. And so that was one problem. The second, obviously, was gender. Now, across the world, people feel and think that Japanese women don't work. That's not true at all. In fact, actually, Japanese women are just as likely to work as American women or women in, in, like me in the UK. However, when they have children, they're much less likely to go back to work. And as a consequence of that, the senior echelons of Japanese companies have very few women in them. Um, there was an issue about health. These long hours were definitely creating health problems, but also in terms of globalization. I was t talking to people in the, uh, the US and the UK subsidiaries of Japanese multinationals, and they felt that they weren't really part of the decision making, you know, that they felt that the decisions were being made in Tokyo. It's very difficult for them to be part of it. Now, I am not saying anything that everybody who it runs a Japanese company is already knowing. And I remember talking to a Japanese CEO some years ago and saying, and he was saying, how do we change this? And I said, it's almost like a walnut. You know, it's the whole system is so tight. Either we try and prise it open or we take something and we smash it. Well, that's what COVID did. It was an absolutely extraordinary smashing of that walnut. And I have followed that from the very beginning. I'm very fortunate in that respect to have great context. And, and actually, the company I want to bring to your attention is Fujitsu, who's no different, I think, than the other companies in this room. But it just happens that we've been following it. And this is what happened to Fujitsu. Within one week last March, after we'd all come back from Davos, uh, they moved 80,000 people out of their offices into their homes, 80,000 people in one week. And actually, we looked at survey data before the move and after the move. And people before the move said, the office is the best place for us to work. That was really the, how people felt. But after the move, people were saying, we don't want to go back. And in fact, the CEO of, of Fujitsu, as indeed I think many of you have said, we're not going back. So what does not going back mean? Well, let me give you a couple of observations about that. And I've actually written about the Fujitsu case in a Harvard Business Review article, which will be out in May. And so I'll say more about that. But here's a couple of obvious things. Firstly, what an office is completely changes. So you have to think about how do we build collaboration? How do we build innovation? How do we build satellites right across Japan that allow people to work nearer their home? Secondly, we need to think much more about time. How do we use time, particularly as knowledge workers? You know, time-based performance is very important in factories. So if you're on a Toyota factory line, if somebody works eight hours, they do more work than if they work five hours or six hours, but that's not true 
for knowledge worker. And I think the challenge we face in Japan is moving our performance systems for ones which were primarily built for Japan's great growth, which was around its factory systems, to something which is much more around knowledge workers. So we have to change the way we think about productivity, and we have to change the way we think about time. But there are real uh, prizes to be won here, and let me let me just mention a few of them. Uh, number one is it will give Japan access to the globalization of talent, both in terms of its Japanese uh, people, but also bringing ideas inside. Uh, we heard earlier about Japanese entrepreneurial rates, which are lower than most developed countries. And that's in part, I believe, because young Japanese uh, kids who would be entrepreneurs are not connected enough to the rest of the world. This could create stronger globalization of talent. Secondly, it'll change the way we think about innovation and change the way Japanese, it will give Japanese organizations an enormous boost. My God, if you can move 80,000 people from an office into the home in one week, what else could you do? It's a huge boost to how we might reinvent and reinvigorate Japanese. And, 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 and finally, as Professor Takenaka said, it's the beginnings of building a flexible labor market. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Grattan, for that very positive energy. Uh, that, that was really, we needed that shot. Uh, and I, I loved your comment about access to global talent. Uh, one of the puzzles uh, many of us feel is why isn't Japan or Tokyo more of a hub in the way that some other cities are in Asia Pacific? So this might just open up that opportunity. Could I come back to Mr. Kengo Sakurada? please. Um, Mr. Sakurada, having, having listened to everyone uh, talk about the macro and micro issues, what are your thoughts now about the post-COVID future? What insights can Japanese business leaders draw from the country's own stakeholder value system to build back better? Thank you. Thank you for the great question. Uh, since we have just started the journey, new journey, to search new capitalism or sustainable or stakeholder capitalism under the Great Reset. I would like to talk about uh, Japan's practical wisdom and uh, Pinkoro. Let me explain Pinkoro later in detail. But firstly, I'd like to touch upon Japan's practical wisdom. Um, Japan's practical wisdom, this is historically cultivated to control and organize barbarians or warriors in an ancient civil war period in Japan. At that time, the kingdom leaders were always at risk in a turbulent society because of violence and discrimination. I would say that the Japan's practical wisdom is a rule of conduct that emphasizes the spirit for common good and the balance between altruism and self-interest in order to control the many, many warriors, particularly or practically. And this is a tacit wisdom of self-control system for society. Under this new rule of contract, under this, under this rule, individuals are implicitly act for the common good of society without top-down instructions or predetermined dogma or specific religion. We have learned practically under the rule of conduct that trust in society, a long-term relationship within the community can help control society in a better way. I'd like to give, us, give an example of Japan's practical wisdom. As you know, 10 years ago, Japan was hit by a major earthquake Lifelines were cut off, and uh, this made it difficult for all people to obtain necessary necessity of life. However, in that chaotic situation, victims of earthquake line up neatly for hours to receive the relief supplies, and they share those supplies with others when necessary. No rooting, no looting, no let alone no rioting. Another example should be Sampo Yoshi, as you correctly put that, 
or quoted by Professor Shuov as a key to stakeholder capitalism. This wisdom is translated as three-way three -way satisfaction. Three means business should provide benefits for buyers and sellers and eventually society. Sampo Yoshi and the rule of conduct, rule of conduct which I described at the beginning, is well explained in a book titled Bushido, written by Dr. Inazo Nitobe. And that has common philosophy and influenced very much the formation of Japanese society now. I believe this Japan's practical wisdom can help building a sustainable society and acting for the future. Having said that, I must, of course, accept that Japan's practical wisdom could lead to challenges such as too much conformity and monoculture and penchant for membership type of corporations, as Jinda said. For the last 30 years, Japan has stayed in a comfortable zone and seems to postpone necessary but sometimes painful changes in the society. However, in this particular situation, pandemic crisis hit the world and sustainability of society was questioned. I would like to propose now, now is the time for Japan to contribute to build a sustainable society by leveraging her practical wisdom. And because I'm a business person, I would like to give a real example of using Japan's practical wisdom. That is pursuing pink color society, as I described at, this, at, the, uh, at the beginning. Pink color means a people live long, and spend their last days by joy and laughter, and eventually experience a swift death. <laughs> My company entered nursing care business as an investment for the future to make Japanese society sustainable. To tackle the issues such as growing cost of nursing care and the shortage of human resources to support the operation, and we're trying, we are trying to transform nursing care business by employing technology, particularly data, and data and digital technologies. We are now seeking sustainable nursing care, which allows individuals to live out their lives in their own ways. Our goal is to realize that pink color society, a society pursuing a long and spry, spry, spry life, life and a quick and uh, pain, painless death. Long-lasting happiness of elderly will have to reduce the cost of elder care and solve the human resource shortage. In turn, this should have a positive impact on a nation's fiscal soundness. By creating a model for sustainable aging society, I'm convinced that we can contribute to the world that is facing the same problem sooner or later. This should be our realistic contribution to achieving the SDGs. Hmm. As you know, Japan has the th third largest economy already. In addition, Japan has resources for growth, future growth, such as technological capabilities and high quality real data, such as medical data from universal health insurance system. So Japan can contribute the Great Reset, mobilizing these resources and Japan's practical wisdom. As a conclusion, I'd like to highlight again Japan, Japan's practical wisdom on being color to realize our sustainable future. Thank you very much for enduring. Thank you so much, Mr. Sakurado. May I now invite, we have two distinguished chairmen of the boards um, here with us today. May I first invite Dr. Nobuhiro Endo, chairman of NEC Corporation, for some quick comments, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Siddiqui. Uh, thank you very, very much for your kind introduction. Uh, following today's discussion, uh, let me uh, talk about my uh, thoughts on companies' role in a human society. A uh, relation between the companies and the human being society is, I uh, believe, is the two sides of the same coin. Uh, because the, uh, for human being society, sustainability is of great importance. And uh, uh, for companies, the most important thing is uh, business continuity. So when the company creates the values 
and uh, contribute to the sustainability of the society, then the society can keep the sustainability and evaluate the values of the contribution of the company. And as a result, the company can uh, continue to work. Therefore, sustainability of the society and the continuity of the company are supporting or aligned each other. And uh, these uh, two are actually two sides of the same coin. I really, I really believe that. And considering those, the company needed to recognize that we have a quite important role, not only to create a value, but needed to indicate or to show the long-term vision of a human society. I do believe that only the company can do that. So in other words, incorporating uh, so, uh, so societal uh, issues and the essential of the requirement of the human society into strategy and operations by continuous, uh, continuously fostering a deep dialogue with the society is extremely, extremely important uh, for the continuity uh, value creation and the continued uh, contributions. So we, um, the one company can do com complete the uh, long-term vision by, by themselves. So we really would like to uh, contact with other companies and discuss how to indicate human uh, society's long-term vision. For example, in the area of the energy, uh, food distribution, uh, technology uses, especially focusing on the total optimization as a globe solution. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Endo. Now may I invite Mr. Sunichi Miyanga, Chairman of Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, for your valuable comments. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Sidekji. Uh, I have prepared my yes, uh, yes, statement or uh, comments, but the, after uh, listening to many, uh, many distinguished uh, speakers, uh, saying i just i'd like to stress uh, uh three things one is the uh the covid uh, 19 is a i think the, the first and and grave uh, gave a uh, vast and grave uh damage uh but the i think the this is uh we need to yes uh yes make uh, this uh, pandemic uh, yes accelerate the uh, kind of the stakeholders capitalism and the that is the I think the it's a more advanced yes philosophy and elaborated uh, yes uh, capitalism yes the capitalism itself the changed evolved and uh, over uh, from time to time uh, over 19th and 20th centuries and now the we are uh, we need to yes uh, think about the stakeholders capitalism it's uh, i think the without this uh, this kind of uh, philosophy or concepts the it we will not be able to yes uh, sustain or the our world Yes, which uh, is going to be uh, yes exposed to the another kind of pandemics and other uh, disasters, uh, natural disasters and others. And so it is very important. And so uh, yes, promote uh, aggressively that kind of stakeholders capitalism. We should not uh, going back to the old uh, systems and society but the i think to completely yes renew uh, our systems uh, quickly is a little bit difficult and dangerous and so for some a little bit longer time targets and effort we need to yes we should yes change drastically but the other areas we had better yes skip some areas and try and adjust and so on right. and sometimes we have we have to jump 
to some extent. That is uh, number one. And I think the under, uh, I believe, the stakeholder capitalism is uh, very similar to the, uh, Mr. Sakurada uh, said, as Mr. Sakurada said, the uh, three-way or the other people say, the three-way or multi-way uh, satisfaction. Yeah. Uh, the, that kind of concept or uh, business philosophy is common in Japan, but the such uh, philosophy and our activities and business operations are sometimes uh, the, a little uh, receptive or the passive. Yes. So we should, yes, uh, make our or change our business activities more active or uh, interactive with the uh, overseas uh, partners and business uh, systems. That is the, I think the sometimes Japanese society, yes, would uh, tend to endure. Of course, endure, uh, endurance is very important and effective to uh, overcome the difficulties. But the, at the same time, the, it is good for some a little closed and homogeneous society. For the diverse, uh, diversified societies and the many uh, which uh, the, uh, consists on uh, consist on uh, the of the various kinds of regionality. We need to yes find uh, I think the, uh, some the common universal yes uh, right our, our areas of the duties and also the to satisfy some regional differences, it is very important. So we need to, uh, Japanese society, Japanese business leaders uh, should become more explainable, explainable and they find some other global or the international uh, yes, way to overcome or the, to satisfy. And number three, the last, I think if to do so, the, we had better find or make our efforts to find a very good uh, advanced statistics uh, using uh, artificial intelligence and uh, digital, uh, so, uh, yes, digitalization. And the, it is very uh, helpful to uh, promote the uh, capitalism, stakeholders capitalism, especially the metrics area. It is very important. And the Japanese society uh, or the Japanese business society is very much capable of uh, doing so. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Miyanga. And with that, we bring today's session to a close. We conducted a sweep of issues and gathered many insights for action in a very short space of time. Extremely valuable, I'm sure, to our audience from Japan, Asia, and the rest of the world. Very grateful to the speakers for your contribution, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. And with that, we'll bring this to a close. Goodbye.